All right, I am going to say good morning and expect that many of you out in the lobby who are still eating bacon on a stick and cinnamon rolls are gonna hear me and go ahead and come on in and get ready to join us. They're doing great things. For those of you watching online out in the lobby, they're getting name tags and t-shirts and bacon and uh, they're chatting and they'll be heading in here in a minute. But a big welcome. Uh, to those of you guys who are in the room right now, those of you who will be coming in momentarily, and uh, those watching online, thanks for being a part of worship here at Northminster this morning. Part of the reason we have all of this going on is today is our kickoff Sunday, which seems kind of strange. What does it mean for a kickoff Sunday to be in the, the second week of September? Well, this is when we kick off all of our school year programming, when kind of you can set a date on the calendar and know if there's something that you're getting involved in or something you're connected with here at Northminster, it's gonna restart and get rolling here right as the, the new year starts in September. Um, so one of the ways that you can help us right now is going to be to grab that card that you received when you came in. It's a, it's a connect card. It allows you to share your information with us and to share your presence with us. The other thing you can do to help me is remind the people who are coming in when they sit down next to you to fill out the card. Don't forget to fill out the card. So as they fill out that card, you'll go ahead and, uh, and uh, drop that in the buckets as you go today, and it just helps us care for one another. We want to do that because that's part of who we are at Northminster. We believe that God has called us to represent Jesus' love in the world, and we do that by three key things here at Northminster. We do that by connecting in friendships, like just getting to know each other, making ourselves um, open to one another, reaching out to, to make, um, make friendships and relationships and to get, to get to connect our lives with one another. We call that moving in. We also believe that God has called us to be transformed by his word. We're going to talk more about that later today, but this idea that God wants to make us different, make, wants us to look more like Jesus. And so we call that moving up. And then finally, we believe here at Northminster, God has called us to represent his love by moving out. And we believe that's as we serve. We serve our community. We serve one another. We serve the whole world around us as the opportunities arise, as we see, see a need. And we do that in Jesus' name. At Northminster, we move in, up, and out. One of the key ways to do that coming up just this month is called Serve the City. We have a long-standing partnership with an organization um, downtown called the Dream Center. You've probably heard us talk about it before, but the Dream Center does a great job of serving um, families and kids in need here in Peoria, and uh, as we partner with them, we have opportunities to do things that are coming up like this one on September 24th. All the information's in your bulletin. But it's a, it's a day when Dream Center organizes folks like us from all over the city to go and tackle little projects that serve other people. So there's all kinds of different things you may be doing if you participate in, Dream, in Serve the City with the Dream Center. But you can sign up for that by going to their website, or you can learn more about that on our website or in your bulletin, or you can always talk to a member of the mission team. They probably have mission written on their name tag, but um, Lori Rolfing would be a big one. And Lori and Roger have their Serve the City t-shirts on. They were anticipating they're awesome. So <laughs> you can find them with a Serve the City t-shirt and they will tell you more. Oh, Leanne's got one too, so you can talk to Leanne. Oh, and Mary. Oh, look at you guys. Their mission is on it, you guys. Um, so yeah, you can go ahead and find them in their t-shirts or if they have mission on their badge and find more about Serve the City. Um, let me give you an idea what to expect today. So we're going to have um, worship. It's going to be a little more. We're going to add some things in. We're going to talk about what you can uh, expect this year, what it's going to look like, how God might be leading us. We're going to pray. We're going to sing. We're going to hear from God's word. And then we're done. You're going to have an opportunity to go back out. If you didn't get a t-shirt, to grab a t-shirt, have some more um, bacon on a stick and some more treats. Um, kids are going to get an opportunity. If they want to see their rooms again, they can go down and check out the kids' men rooms. But the big idea is that when we're done today, you might stay and, and um, just connect with one another, have some conversations, talk to someone you haven't gotten a chance to talk to in a while, um, and that's what we're here to do today. So let's go ahead and let's just begin as we get called into worship. So why, why is bacon so tasty? What makes bacon so incredibly delicious? It actually turns out to be a particular reaction called the Majar reaction. It's spelled Mylard, but it's pronounced Majar. Back in 1912, there was this chemist by the name of Luis Camille Majar, and he uh, uh, was the first to describe and understand the chemical process behind it, and it helps us to understand bacon. 
It turns out that there are a set of amino acids, and when you combine those with um, reducing sugars in the context of high temperature, that equals the incredible taste of bacon. It, uh, it's called a non-enzymatic reaction, for those of you that are taking notes. And yes, there will be a quiz later. I was thinking that what makes for delicious w uh, worship, what makes for a tasty experience as we come together, I would argue that the first ingredient is the presence of God. That when we come together to worship, to, to sing and to pray and to learn, um, that God's presence is the difference maker. But then when we add to God's presence a submissive heart, that each one of us can come with an open heart to whatever God wants to reveal, that we would be honest with God and welcome God's word into our lives. And then if you do that in the context of fellowship, that we're together gathered around this loving God of ours, that that provides a reaction uh, that opens us up to all that God wants to do in our midst. And so we have come to worship, knowing God is present, having looked at our hearts and know that we're open to God's movement and enjoying the fellowship of being together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we indeed get to enjoy your presence today. And may you find in each one of us a heart that is open, a, a willingness to submit to all of who you are and all that you would have for us. And we thank you that we get to do this in an environment of being together, of fellowshipping. May you be glorified in our worship this morning. In Christ's name, amen. I invite you to stand as we sing. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. Oh, me. Yeah. 
Hallelujah. Um, I want to invite the Northminster Choir to come up, and we're going to sing these two hymns. I think there's power in these hymns. I think that God will anoint our time together. Let's sing Amazing Grace together.
así. going to ask any kids in the room to come and bail me out and come up here. <laughs> we got any of your kids in the room? So if you're in preschool through fifth grade, if you just started school this past handful of weeks, go ahead and come up, come up here. I need your help. I think you guys are going to be smarter about some things than I am. So let's have a seat up here. Oh, some of us already have our t-shirts on. Good deal. Good deal. Coming on up. All right. You guys ready to help me? I mean, you guys know I always need some help with these things. So do you like emojis? Do you guys know emojis? Do you have a favorite emoji that you can picture in your mind right now? Picture in your mind your favorite emoji. My guess is these guys might have favorite emojis. Do you guys have favorite emojis? Anyone out there have favorite emoji? Picture your favorite emoji in your mind. And because I'm in charge right now, I get to share mine. Can I share my favorite emojis? All right. I like, I like this one. I like this emoji. Do you guys like this emoji? Yeah, do you guys know when this emoji is? It's like, okay, you know, <laughs> blank face. I like that one. Can I, sh can I share my other favorite emoji? I, you guys might like this one, too. Do you guys like tacos? Taco emoji, high-quality emoji, right? High-quality emoji, all right. My last, maybe my favorite one is this, is this one. My face may do this more than I want it to. I like this emoji. The kind of, like, you know, half smile, like, okay, out of the corner of your mouth. <laughs> you guys like... It's a sly emoji. All right, sly. Apparently, I'm a smirk. Yeah, that's what I thought. All right, those are my favorite emojis. You guys got your favorite emojis in your head. Here's what I think. Uh, um, and we're going to use emojis to help us do something today. There's something that we do every worship service when we gather. Um, it's going to be really obvious. Every time when we gather as God's people, we pray. But we have this really specific thing called the congregational prayer. Congregational prayer. My favorite is one time when a student called it the congressional prayer, and that just cracks me up. It's the congregational prayer. And every week, someone from this church, lots of times it's me, but sometimes it's other people, we, we write a prayer to say in worship service. And so I thought this morning, instead of writing a prayer, you guys might help me with the prayer this morning. So to me, having to write. You guys ready? Can you turn on, click your brains on? Because I need big brain time from you guys. But what's going to help us is some emojis going to help us make our prayer this morning. Okay, so to remind us what we're doing, I have the praying emoji, which I realize some people think is a high five emoji, but I'm going to pass this all the way down. Let's hold it all the way down. Hold that one up. That reminds us what we're doing. All right, first thing that's going to help us write our prayer this morning is this emoji. One of you guys tell me what this emoji means. Party, party. What do you do at a party? Celebrate. That was the word I was looking for. Yes. Um, celebrate, right? And so one of the things that we do in our prayer, I'm going to pass it down, the next person can hold that one. One of the things that we do in a prayer is we think what we can celebrate, what we can praise God for. What do you guys, can you guys help me? Can you come up with a couple things? What are something that we can praise God for? Yeah. For sending Jesus to die for us on the cross. Good. What are some other things we could praise God for? Yeah. You want me to figure it out? Do you think, what about that he made the world? He made the world. That's a good one. <laughs> Who came up with that? What's, uh, what might be one other thing? What do you guys think? Yeah. I know what I want to say, but I can't phrase it. I know that feeling. Know what you want to say and can't phrase it? Yep. <laughs> I'm with you. How about, how about we praise God because he loves us? Does that work out? All right, I got another one. What does this emoji mean? It's sad. Sad, depressed. <laughs> All right, I'll pass that one down. All right, that emoji is going to be um, that we, when we pray together, we tell God about the things that we've done that hurt his heart. And we call it confession. That's a big fancy word for saying, hey, I'm sorry. And so we always include as part of our prayer a way of saying sorry to God. Now, I won't make you guys share examples of those, <laughs> right? I won't make you do that. But we all have things we can say sorry to God for, and so that's always part of our prayer. You want to see the next one? Happy! That's right. All right. Next one is happy. We'll pass that one down. 
happy because as part of our prayer, we can always remind ourselves what God has done for us. We can always remind ourselves that God forgives us because of what Jesus did on the cross. So that's always part of our prayer. I've got one other one. I'm going to hand it this way since we're over here alone. All right, that's a gift. That's a gift. You guys see that one? So a gift means as part of our prayer, we can always ask God to do something for us and for our congregation. What is something that you guys might want to ask God for this morning? What's something we could ask God for? You guys got any ideas? Yeah. A new life. That's a great, yes, we can ask God to give us new life in Jesus. That's good. What else? What's something you could ask God for this morning? How many of you guys need help at school sometimes? How many of you guys might need help with friends sometimes? Or how many of you guys might need help with a sibling? <laughs> right? Oh, there's that one. All right. There's all kinds of things we can ask God for. So we'll include that in our prayer. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you guys to help me while I do a prayer this morning. So hold those emojis up. If you've got an emoji sheet, hold those up. Those are going to help all of us remember what we're doing we're going to pray. We're going to tell God things that we're excited about, we're celebrating. We're going to tell God we're sorry. We're going to remind God how happy we are that he saved us in Jesus. And then we're going to ask him to do some things for us. Would you guys join me as we do the congregational prayer this morning? Let's pray. God, we thank you so much. Um, like, like these kids have said, we thank you that you gave us Jesus. And that he died on the cross that we would know you. We thank you that you made the whole world around us, that because of who you are, you made it so that we could come to know you. God, we praise you because you love us. And we know that, and we feel that in this place. God, we're sorry. We know that sometimes we do things that hurt other people, and we do things that hurt you. God, we ask that you would forgive us because we want to be people who live according to your word because you have saved us and made us your own. And we thank you. We're so happy that Jesus forgives us, that because he died on the cross, we know what it means to be right with you again. And so we ask you for things. We ask you to bless this church. Here at the beginning of this ministry year, we ask that you would be present in our lives. We ask that you would be transforming us to look more like Jesus. We ask that you would be at work in all of us. We ask that you would help us at school or at our jobs or in our homes. When sometimes we have to do things we don't always like and sometimes we need to work really hard. Would you give us strength? God, we know that sometimes it's hard for us to be around our siblings or our families or sometimes we care about our friends or sometimes there's people we know that are hurting. God, we ask that you would be with those people. And we know that we can ask them because you love us. And you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hey, guys, thanks for your help. That was awesome. You can go have a seat. And as they go back to their parents, you can take your emojis or give them to me. And as they go back, let's stand and greet one another and share your favorite breakfast food. Let's stand and greet one another and share your favorite breakfast food. Thank you. Thank you.
as you guys get done chatting, you can have a seat. You're good. Keep saying hi. Keep talking about your favorite omelet or skillet or pancake. It's really good. We just wanted to take a, a few moments in, the, in our service today to talk about um, what is really, what are we really kicking off? What are we really doing this morning as we set this particular Sunday apart uh, and, and talk about what God might be doing amongst us and uh, in our church? I was reading an article this week, and this, um, the author had a really good idea that I'm stealing right now. But she talked about the documentary that she watched about how pianos are made. And uh, i got to find this documentary, but apparently they traced the, the creation of a piano from literally picking out a tree um, in, the, in a forest in the northwest somewhere and cutting it down and transporting it across the country to the Steinway factory in New York and, and what happens to that piano. And one of the things that she mentioned about what happens in building a piano is that they pick this, these pieces of wood that they really want and they have to kind of get it to a certain humidity in a certain way and then they bend it in a form like a form that makes that basic piano shape, and then it just sits in a warehouse for a whole year or more. It just sits there. They don't do anything to it. That part of what's happening in the creation of a piano is that they apply certain pressure and they allow certain things to happen in, that, in the life of that wood to make the shape that they want it to shape. They put it in a form, and it comes out the shape that they intended it's a little bit what we mean when we use in this setting formation. When we talk about faith formation, what we're saying is that all of our lives have some bendiness to them, right? All of our lives have some bendiness, and, and they can look different. Our lives can change. Our, our experiences can change. Our character can develop and grow, and this is exactly what God has intended for you and I. God actually tells us in his word that he intends for us to be conformed into the image of Jesus, that he wants us to be shaped, to be formed, to look more like his son. And so we believe that as a church, part of what we're called to do, part of what it means to be a family of believers, is that we want to provide spaces and opportunities to get in that form, to have those pressures on us, those shaping pressures on us, those, those opportunities, those experiences that will make our lives bend and be shaped to the image of Jesus. And then we find that somewhere along the way, we went from just being a tree in the forest somewhere to being a piano that can make beautiful music. And that's our, our heart's desire for all of you. Whether you're in this room right now, whether you're watching online, whether that you, you're going to catch up later on about what this kickoff Sunday is about, our heart's desire is that you would experience this year all those little things that might help you and I look more like Jesus Christ. And we think there's particular things that we do to help us on the way. The church has known this for thousands of years. The church has known for thousands of years there are these key things that we can engage in, these key habits we can develop that press us in and mold us and shape us into what God has intended for us. They're really simple, right? They're prayer and scripture reading and being part of a community and serving the world around us. Right? The, the things that we talk about all the time, worshiping him, all the things that the church has been doing. But we believe that as we make a habit of those things, that they're going to shape us this year. So my question for you is, what kinds of things will you engage in that will shape you to look like Jesus? Because the truth is, we're going to look different in 12 months than we do now. There's all kinds of forces in our life. There's all kinds of things shaping us, whether it's the Netflix shows that we binge or the news channels that we watch or the people that we spend our time with at work or the, the websites that we read or like our, who we've curated into our Twitter feeds or our Facebook follows. Those things shape us. And wouldn't it be great if we could here at the beginning of a school year say, hey, I'm going to intentionally pursue things that will shape me to look more like Jesus. So here's the opportunities that we have that maybe help with us. When you came in this morning, you should have gotten a bulletin or you're sitting near one, someone who has one. And if you open that bulletin up, you'll see on the back side, there is a list of all of these little things, these, these opportunities, these programs within which we might experience formation. Because all these things are going to include to some degree, larger or smaller, prayer, worship, Bible reading, community, and service. And so um, as you look at these, I just want to go through these things really quick. And I want you to go through 
through them with an eye for how can I participate? What might God be calling me to this year in 2022, 2023? What might God be calling me to to allow myself to be shaped to look more like Jesus. Let's start from the bottom, and let me just remind you what we have for kids. Kids, you have an opportunity every Sunday morning to meet with leaders and other kids as we go through scripture together, as we pray together, as we learn together in a little community. We call it kid groups. It happens at the 10-10 hour. It's a great opportunity for preschool um, through, uh, through fifth grade to gather in their their classes and learn about Jesus. And so kids, we want you to be formed as you come to kid groups. There's obviously also nursery for younger than that, and the nursery does a great job of trying to make sure even the little, little, little ones hear the love of Jesus when they're here at church. For students, we have great opportunities for you. Middle schoolers, you have youth group on, Sunday, on Wednesday nights from 7 to 8.30. We do the same things. We're going to play some games. We're going to eat some snackies. We're going to learn from God's word, and we're going to be in small groups where we can uh, share what God is doing and learn more about who he is. And then high schoolers, they're going to do the same thing on Sunday nights from 7 to 9 as they um, do the same things. But as in the middle of all of that kind of fun and gathering and connection, we're allowing Jesus to shape us as we learn about who he is and we let it interact with us our lives. For both middle and high school, or yeah, both middle and high school students, there's also faith training on Sunday mornings. 1010 down in the Trinity room. Uh, we're going to be walking through the story of the Bible this year. It's going to be pretty awesome. So uh, we'd love to see you there. All right, adults, you guys have the most awesome and the most complicated list. Are you ready? Listen to this. This is an ability to, this is a chance, an opportunity to check in with maybe what God might do, um, how you might get involved. First thing, we would love for everyone to be involved in a life group. A life group is just a group of adults who gather once a week-ish, and, uh, and they gather around what uh, was preached here on a Sunday morning. That's the kind of the, the content. But the much more important thing that, uh, that happens is that we get to talk to one another, and we get to share what's going on in our lives, and we get to take kind of the input that we received here and let it kind of sink into us and talk through how that might apply and how that might be challenging us or helping us grow. There is a Sunday morning life group that's going to meet always right around the corner here, and, uh, and that's led by uh, Mr. Stuck and some others, and so we'd love any, any Sunday you're here and you just want to stick around and be part of a good conversation based on what we heard in uh, worship, that's a great opportunity for you. There are three Monday night opportunities. Monday night's a hot night around here, you guys. Um, but there's three great Monday night opportunities, one at the Rollins House, one at the Robinson House, and then uh, one with the Vandermides, and you can find out more about that by um, contacting those people, and our contact information is on the sheet, but we'd love for you to consider being part of one of those life groups. We also have three great Bible studies available. Those Bible studies um, happen at different times. One is on Sunday morning with um, Greg Manship, and they're still, they're going to finish out the Gospel of Mark, I think. They've been working through it. It's been great in depth, and they would love to see you on a Sunday morning. You just want a little bit of in-depth Bible study and in, in uh, uh, directly from the book of Mark. That's a great opportunity. Then there's our women's Bible study, which Kim and Pat so faithfully lead, and um, they have a, they're going through the parables, and they have a book that they work through, and ladies, if you want to be a part of that, that's Tuesday mornings. Uh, you can find all the information here. And then finally, on Thursday nights, um, uh, the, the Thursday night study that I usually lead is actually going to be taken over by one of our new friends, Michael Berg, and I'm going to be there with him, and we're going to be working, working through the story of the temple and the presence of God. We'd love to have you there with us for that study this fall. But two interesting opportunities. I just, we don't ever know what bucket to put things like this in. We know that many of you are part of Bob and Vicki's um, Sunday morning conversation Bible study that happens in the gathering place. Um, and so if you just want to be part of a, a group of maybe younger people or um, people with kids or people who are single or people who are like figuring it all out, you are all welcome in that group. Um, you all fit in and uh, they just kind of meet in the gathering place and they hang out and they chat about life and what God might be up to and and uh, stuff like that, so you can learn more about that opportunity. And finally, we're really excited that starting this week, um, Kim and Greg and Wesley are going to host a viewing of the TV show, The Chosen. I don't know if you've heard about this, but it's a pretty highly acclaimed uh, television show that walks through the life of Jesus. It's just um, several seasons. They're going to do the first season, and so they're going to gather here, and I heard there's going to be popcorn and maybe some snackies, and you can hang out. Um, they're going to gather, and they're going to watch together and then discuss on Friday night. So it's just a fantastic fantastic opportunity to kind of have a, if you're like not super excited about sitting behind a table and talking about, you know, maybe your life or opening the Bible, it's a great opportunity just to kind of be present with the story of Jesus and then dig into it a little bit more in community. Adults, here's what I want to ask you to do. Just pick something. Just pick something and get plugged in with it. Even if you know, hey, I probably can do that two times a month, go ahead and do those two times a month. But pick something. Allow yourself to get placed into that form. 
Because here's what I'm going to ask you to do as the praise team comes back up and they're going to lead us in a moment. But as they come, I just want you to know that you have a choice. We have a choice to invest in the things that will make us look more like Jesus. And so I want to encourage you, think about it, prayerfully consider where might you get plugged in so that you can be participating in the process which God transforms us to look more like Jesus and takes us from being a tree to being a piano. Um, hey, everybody. I want to invite you guys to stand. Uh, we're going to learn a new song today, um, kind of on brand for today. Uh, it's really awesome when we get to actually sing the words of Scripture. Um, and so today we get to do that uh, with this song. We get to actually sing Micah 6, 8, which is uh, the sermon that we're, we're about to hear and the verse that is on the back of your shirts, if you can't tell. Uh, but it's just a really awesome song of just singing of, of our, our duty and, and what we're supposed to do to, uh, for each other. But um, I'm going to teach you this chorus, and we're going to sing the rest of the song. So here's how it goes. I just live, love mercy, walk humbly with you, God, in all things, in all ways, walk humbly with you, God. I invite you to sing. Let's sing this chorus out. I just live, love mercy, walk humbly with you, God, in all things, in all ways, walk humbly with you, God, it all comes down to this, what you require of me, love my neighbor as myself, and you Just one more time. Act justly. Act justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly. There's this friend of mine, uh, a mentor uh, at a church that I was serving a number of years back, Dave Gall, and he had this, this philosophy that he would um, uh, uh, repeat and stand behind uh, quite often. He would share that, you know, people always do what they want to do. People always do what they want to do. So we might explain that this way, that, that uh, if you have a task to do, and you have this choice between doing the task or procrastinating, you will make the choice on, based on what you want to do. You, you, will, you might choose procrastinating uh, um, because that just seems a lot more enjoyable than actually doing the particular task. That is, until the weight and the anxiety around getting that task uh, raises high enough to where now all of a sudden you want to do it. Like, like the equation change, and, and you want to make the... It's not that you basically like the task, but when you get to that point where 
you want more to make sure you don't deal with the consequences, you stop procrastinating and you do the task. But sometimes that can be really, really hard to make that shift. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're, you walk into the cheesecake factory and, and you walk past that display counter and you see a piece of the caramel apple cheesecake on your way, to, on your way in. You order your meal and, and you have whatever it is you chose off of that 400-page menu, and, and you enjoyed it. And, and it's a huge meal. It often is a huge meal at the Cheesecake Factory. And you get to that spot, and you wonder, should I have a piece of that caramel apple cheesecake? Now, all kinds of dynamics are in play. You've got blood sugars that are, are taking place. You've got these internal chemical reactions. You have, you have your biology, you have your physiology. You've got psychology taking place. All those stories from when you were a kid come rushing in. You've got economics at play. You've got a social dynamic. Maybe the person who you're with ordered one. You're going, well, I might as well be encouraging of them. And what if I didn't? I don't want to make them feel bad. So let me also. And so you have this choice. Do I eat the caramel apple cheesecake? Or do I stay on my diet? You're going, well, I don't like my diet, but you have this thing you're weighing together. And all these forces come into play. People always do what they want to do. When it comes to wanting God, the Bible informs us that the initial experience of wanting God, that we're dependent on God to bring that about. That God is the one who quickens our hearts. That, that God is the one who moves toward us first. It's not that we love God, but that God loved us and gave his son for us. God moves, God quickens our hearts that we might then be able to want God. We call and talk about that in terms of conversion. That, that God would... Um, quicken our hearts, bring us to life, that, that we would have this experience through, through the work of Jesus Christ, that we would experience justification by faith, and that we would receive salvation. And, and all this has taken place in that experience of coming to that place of wanting God, the work of God. But then what happens after that? The big question, now that we want God, do we really want the God of the Bible? Now that we want God, do we really want the God of the Bible? The description that Joss gave us, that do we really want to be bended? Do we really want to be formed or conformed into the image of Jesus and, and be used of God to, to make beautiful music in this world? Do we want to become like Jesus? We call that formation. That yes, there's this experience of, of coming into the faith, of, of having our hearts quickened, but then there's that ongoing journey of being formed into the image of Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk in, and explore about in the coming weeks. Wanting God. Wanting God. According to God, what does it look like to really want God? Today our focus will be on embracing what God requires. To want God would involve embracing what God requires. We're going to be looking at a little passage from the book of Micah. He's one of the minor prophets, not that he works underground. It's not that he is younger. It's not that he um, is less important. It's that there are, these are shorter uh, books in the Bible. There are 12 of them. There are the major prophets, the minor prophets. And it turns out that uh, Micah, according to uh, scholars that that he was working right alongside Isaiah and that during the same time period and and probably toward um, uh, the end of Hezekiah's time toward the end of the 8th century BC somewhere right around 701 BC it was a time just before the Assyrians came down and laid siege on Jerusalem there's a lot of political dynamics going on religious dynamics economic dynamics there was a lot of chaos maybe not unlike what we might be experiencing even today. The rich were getting richer at the expense of the poor. The church was cooperating with this, which brings us to our text. If you have your Bibles with you, and if you're uh, participating in worship um, at home as well, that if you would grab your Bible, and we'll look at Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Let us hear the Word of God. 
with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? May God bless the reading of his word. May God shine his favor upon us as we come under his word. Three, thing God, three things God requires. Do justice, love mercy or kindness. We'll talk about that word in just a minute. Do justice, love kindness, mercy, walk humbly with God. You know, Stephen Covey in his Seven Habits book, highly acclaimed Seven ha Habits book, he, he um, uh, is known for coining the phrase, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And Micah is drawing our attention to the main thing for followers of God, for God's people. Here's the main thing, and not just for God's people, but for all people. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with God. And he helps us get to know a little bit more about all three of these things together uh, in, in a couple of different ways. He provides some explanation. And he explains it through comparison and then through a little bit of definition. First to the comparison. When we look at the first two verses of our little passage, verses 6 and 7, he sets up a comparison for us. A person comes before God. A person asks the question. Maybe you've asked this question. What does God require of me? Does he want me to uh, bring a sacrifice? And here the person describes what would be understood as kind of maybe a normal kind of sacrifice. To, and then he takes it up a notch. He kicks it up a notch. He, he says, how about if I brought thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil in other words, what if, if it's an is it issue about the size of my sacrifice? Would God be pleased if I did that? And then he goes to the extreme. He even layers upon that. The, uh, Micah would have found this repugnant. The, uh, Hebrew, uh, the he Hebrews would find this repugnant. But yet the question is asked. If I brought my own child, would God be pleased with that? Does God want my sacrifice? There's a comparison. There's a comparison going on. Then what Micah also uh, provides is a description. There's a description. He makes a statement before he gets into the do justice, love, mercy, kindness, uh, and walk humbly. He says, um, listen, God has shown you. God has told you. God has revealed to you what is good so good all the other things that do justice love kindness mercy walk humbly with god that that falls under this definition of good it is what is good he has shown you what is good we know from scripture god is good and that God does good. We even look at the first chapter of the Bible and, and that God created all things. And when he created them, he said, this is good. And this is good. And, and when he created all of it together, he goes, this is very good. God is good. And God does good in this world. And so what Mike is calling us to is to the goodness of God. That our lives would be aligned with the goodness of God. With those two explanations, the other thing we, we can identify here at the beginning is uh, to whom this, this instruction, these words are going to. And because of the language that's being used here, the way that the passage is set up, this is going out to everyone. Even the, the, the talking about sacrifice, this could be any one of us, any person standing before God. What is it that God requires of me? What does God want? And then when Micah makes that turn and we see there's this voice going, this change in voice that, that at the end of chapter 7, or verse 7, we no longer have the first person um, 
talking to God, but now it's Micah talking on behalf of God. In other words, because he's a prophet, this is God talking to us. And it's to each person. He has shown you, O Adam, O person, O man, each, each person. He has shown you. God has revealed it. This is what God requires of you. To do justice. To love mercy. To love kindness. And to walk humbly with God. So let's take a look at those real quickly. Do justice. Do justice. There's a couple of different places in the Old Testament where um, uh, part of the law would be worked in that God would describe for the covenant people, the, the gathered people, the, the Hebrews, that um, uh, they were to have just one set of scales, right? They're not to have two set of scales in business. Don't have your, your fair scales and your cheater scales. Whenever you're conducting business, do it fairly. Do it um, according to God's goodness. Take the high road uh, in the midst of all of life. It's a, a pervasive understanding throughout the Old Testament that there's this basic covenant relationship. God calls his people together. He says, for you, and as you interact with the world, I want you to live justly with the people around you. He wants us to respect the humanity of each person. Jesus provides a great picture for this. We call it the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Do you get that picture? What if when we were thinking about, about big questions in the community and, and uh, big policy things the government's working on, what if we entered those conversations of, if I were in a person's place that would be affected by this, what would I need? What would I want? Do unto others. If you were in their place, how you would want them to do unto you. What a great picture. Jesus will go on uh, in Matthew's gospel and, and he'll describe uh, this, this experience at the end of times. He gives this wonderful picture of, of what it means to enter the kingdom of heaven. That, that there would be people that would come to him and, 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 and um, uh, he would say to them that you fed me and you gave me something to drink. You know, when I was hungry, you gave, you gave me food. And when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you came to visit me. When I was in prison, you came to me. They ask, when did we do these things to you? And, and, and he goes, when you did it to the least of these, would you show justice in this world? Would you represent the goodness of God? Do justice in this world. There's a, a, a scholar by the name of J.G. Gibbs in a... Um, an encyclopedia, he puts this forward in terms of uh, the description of God's justice, that it's dynamic rather than static. In other words, it's moving. It's moving forward. It's, it, it shows up in places. It's creative rather than codified. It, it, it looks to discern what is wisdom in this moment. And it creates those opportunities that it's also realistic and not idealistic. It's not just some kind of remove justice. Oh, if we could only have the justice of God. It's meant to be lived. People of God. The justice of God is meant to be seen by the world in the choices we make. So let's take a quick check. Let's take a quick check. Do I enter issues of justice from a Jesus-centric perspective? Do I enter issues of justice from a God-centric perspective? Do I enter issues of justice from a biblical perspective? Maybe if we sweep that away, that, that around, we could ask, do the people around me, can they recognize in my actions, can they recognize in my words the very heart and way of God? Or do they tend to recognize more easily conservatism or liberalism? Do, do they recognize more easily which news channel I happen to watch? Or can they recognize more easily things like anger and judgment and platitudes and inaction and self-preservation and self-promotion and prejudice and laziness and callousness? Do people around me see those things? Or do they see the, 
the high road of God, the justice, the goodness of God in how I move forward. What does God require of us? Do justice. He also says, love mercy or love kindness. This example in, in the Old Testament could also be considered under justice, but, but we'll use it here that, that there was this teaching for the covenant community, the people of God, that, that if you're a landowner and, and it comes harvest time, don't harvest to the edge of your field. Don't optimize the field for your own promotion. Leave some. Leave some of the, uh, the fruit of the field for those who have no land, who, who have no resource in order to have the food. Let them come and collect for themselves. Kindness. Mercy. The, the word is, and we've mentioned about uh, this word in, our, uh, in this room a number of times, but it's the word has said. Has said. It, it's that loving kindness. Loving kindness or steadfast love. Kindness. Mercy. It has this, this connotation of loyalty and faithfulness. One scholar puts this this way. Has said means faithfulness toward others in community. That's what it looks like. Faithfulness toward others in community. Another scholar put it this way. The willingness to do good on behalf of others. The willingness to do good. So if justice is the right action, if justice has this, this sense of calling, of, of doing this goodness, maybe a principle associated with it, then to love kindness gives us the, the heart, the attitude, the, the, the approaching, that it's, it's justice in the context of love. You know, we may be rock solid on our final decisions or our perspectives, in terms of these big issues in life. But we could ask, do people see and experience us as showing kindness and mercy? In other words, when it comes to issues like loan forgiveness or uh, immigration or poverty or racism or global warming, what do people see in us as we form, hold, and share the justice of God to those questions. Do they experience kindness? Do they experience mercy? There's this uh, individual, D.K. McKim. And when he did, talks about the use of chesed in this passage, he says this. It shows that every person becomes every other person's sibling. You can picture that. That if we would approach everybody as, well, that's my sister. That's my brother. That's not just person, that a person who fits under this kind of, of, of tribe or group or, or they're the enemy or they're the other. But we look at the person and we listen to them as, that's my sister. That's my brother. Can you picture a world full of kindness? Can you picture that? What if your whole world this week was just full of kindness all around you? Employer to employee, neighbor to neighbor, team to team, student to student. Kindness. That's God's vision for humanity. It sure is his vision for his children. And what Micah says then, what Micah says on behalf of God is that we're to love this kind of kindness. Love this kind of kind. Of, love this kind of mercy. Um, this one definition appears in encyclopedia. It goes like this: This kind of love is a spontaneous force which drives one to something or someone over against itself. Do you get that? It drives us toward them. It's a kind of love that says, you know, it's not about me. It's not about me. I've got to move toward this. I, I, I want to move toward this. I'm just spontaneous. It moves me. And so to love kindness, to love mercy is to be moved toward it. It's emotion. You can picture love of a spouse to a spouse. Or maybe more relevant to this morning, the love of bacon. Right? Even now as we sit, I will spontaneously move out of my seat after the service and get bacon on a stick. Love kindness, love mercy. Which brings us then to walk humbly with God. Walk humbly with God. 
By the way, have you ever tried to pay attention to your walk? Like all of a sudden just cognitively think about your walk as you're walking? It throws me off. It, it just throws me off. I start thinking, wait, am I doing it correctly? Uh, there have been a few different times where we're, uh, um, we're with family. Vicky uh, would be walking behind my dad and myself. You know, we're with family. We're out somewhere on a walk or at some, some uh, tourist thing or something. And then Vicky will come up to me afterwards and tell, and she's done this. You and your dad walk just the same. What? Don't talk about my walking. Now all of a sudden I'm thinking, are my feet flailing all over the place? And what am I doing with my hips? I don't know. And we don't want to think about our walking. We just want to walk. Maybe that's the approach we take with walking with God. Don't ask me about my walking with God. I don't want to have to think about it. I just want to walk the way I walk with God, and let's just leave it like that, and let's move on with our week. And here's Micah, um, uh, Micah, that is saying, um, walk humbly with God. Walking humbly with God is the right way of walking, given who God is. Given the greatness of God and the goodness of God, walking humbly with Him. And it's not a wimpy word. It's not like uh, just this fake uh, humility, this insincere humility. It's this reality of understanding God's greatness and God's goodness. And, and I am so dependent upon God and what God does in my life and how God provides. And it's walking in recognition of who God is and who I am. Walking humbly with God, doing justice, loving mercy, kindness, and walking humbly with God. The passage says, God has shown you. God has shown us. God has told us. He's made it clear what is good. And what is it that God requires of us? Do justice. Love mercy, love kindness. And walk humbly with him. Do you get the progression of this? That, that there's this heart change. That there's a heart involved. And that our heart would want the very things of God in it. Then that heart impacts our words. And that heart impacts our actions. It could be tempting to come to a passage like this. And say, you know, you're describing a fantastical life. A fantastical life. Yeah, some people might try to stretch toward it, but for the rest of us, eh. God doesn't present this as a fantastical life. He presents it as a faithful life. You know, there's this uh, youth group uh, game that youth groups all over the place play. Maybe they play it in schools. Um, but, you know, you have everybody mingle around or everybody's mingling. And then a leader calls out a number and people then clump together. It's the numbers clumping or something like that. They call out a number seven. And then all the youth, all the people participating have to gather together in groups of seven. And the people who are, don't have a group of seven to gather with, and they step out for the next round. And so it turns out that um, when you look at the church today, it's like we're playing a, a, a game of clumping. And someone yelled out, uh, color of skin, and everybody runs to the church that has the same color of skin. Or some, someone yells out, socioeconomic position, and everybody runs to the, to the gathering of people of the same so, socioeconomic uh, perspective. And Micah is calling us, it's like he yelled out, God. God calls all of us to clump around God's heart, God's way. You know, if you're a parent in this room, um, I, I think I understand something of the dynamic that you're going through. If you're a parent of a young family right now, and I understand a little bit of the dynamic you're going through, it's like whatever busyness that I may have experienced in my journey through parenting young children, that now it's just up to 11. And life seems full. We talk about some programs and some ministries, um, uh, some context, and then the way we relate to each other 
that we want to be able to help you in the raising of your children, to help them understand what it is to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. But we also affirm that a lot of that's going to fall on your shoulders, and it can feel overwhelming. Like, where are you going to find the margin to do that? What I would encourage us is let's lay it over. Even if we don't change anything else in our life, let's lay it over what we're currently doing. And so if you happen to be uh, spending a lot of time on the sidelines, what does it look like to do justice there? The way you treat the families around you. What is it to talk about uh, loving mercy in the car to and from some place? Or what is it to have conversations about walking humbly at the dinner table? What if you, as a mom or a dad, chose to prioritize doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with God in your own life so that the kids could hear your words and see your actions and understand your heart as you yearn for the goodness of God. By the way, uh, we, uh, as part of the announcements today, we have served the city coming up. What a great opportunity to, to set aside maybe some other activities and to engage the family and have a different set of conversations around serve the city. Let me talk to those of you that are in grade school. If you're in grade school, like if you're in third grade or second grade or fifth grade, whatever it might be. So let's say you're in grade school. You know, what would it be at your school if you are focusing on being kind to other people? Because you know God is so good and he calls you to be kind. To kind to teachers, kind to friends, kind to that new kid, kind to the kid that's being bullied. What if you prioritize being kind at your school? Those of you that are in uh, uh, middle school or high school, my, uh, tell you, uh, my hat off to you. Those are incredible years. You're, you're trying to differentiate yourself from your parents a little bit. You're, you're forming your own identity. There's so much going on, the dynamics. The amount of vulnerability that you experience when you're in middle and high school, it takes so much courage to get through a day. So I, I would put before you, as you're one thinking about what does it mean to be a follower of God as a middle schooler, as a, as a high schooler, what does it look like then to take on the goodness of God? To learn as you're forming who you are, as you're trusting that God's going to help you form, what does it look like to do justice and to love mercy? to walk humbly with God. By the way, that's what our youth groups are committed to helping one another as they gather together. And how about for the rest of us, college and 20s and 30s and 50s and whatever it might be, in the midst of you know, career choices and, and trying to secure retirement, all those, what, if, what does it look like then to pursue the goodness of God? That we would clump together around God's goodness, not around whatever seems normal or whatever our default is. People always do what they want. On this day, what, what if we make that choice? In light of what God's already done in our hearts, and God quickened our hearts, and we can want God, and what if we say, no, we really want God? If we want God, then we are saying, we want what God wants. We want what God requires. And God requires us to do good, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with him. And he's given us his son. He's given us his Holy Spirit that we would journey well in, this, in these endeavors. And so, my brothers and my sisters, together with you, I want God. Let's together do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you are the God who makes things clear. And God, we need to depend upon you. We need to depend upon your grace and your love and your presence in our lives. We need to depend upon you uh, and your teaching that we would know the way forward. That we cannot do this on our own and we need each other. Iron sharpening iron. The people of God growing together. God, would you work your justice in our hearts and through our hearts into this world? Would you cause us to be that we would grow in kindness and mercy toward each other and others? 
that, God, we would learn what humility looks like before you, that our lives would be defined uh, by the humility you call us to, that we would walk humbly with you. To you be all the glory. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand and sing. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who shakes the world with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in my wonder? The King of glory. Nathan chose that song for the end because we must hear the gospel in the midst of the call. That It can seem overwhelming, but to know that God is already working on our behalf, that we would be able to successfully live the life he has called us to. It may be that as you've gathered here this morning, you have all kinds of questions. Maybe you have all kinds of rebuttals. Let's have the conversation. Contact Joss, attend one of our life groups, join one of our Bible studies, uh, reach out to me. I, we'd love to have those conversations. Uh, this morning, we have time uh, to gather out in, in, the, in our lobby and, and to explore the building. If, if you've got kids that want to check out their rooms, by all means, they're going to be over this direction. We'll have some of our kid group uh, leaders that'll be over there. You'll see their name and their uh, kid groups underneath it or something. And Just go have fun there. and Let's engage each other. And may we go from here knowing you are loved by God. You can just tell yourself right now, I am loved by God. And let's go into this world and share that love with everybody that God puts around us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all.